Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. That is so beautiful. So you've got that down now. Now I have a new mission statement for you. See, I just gave you our mission statement. That's from Congress, but we also have a vision statement. And here's what that is. We are the only place in these polarized times that brings together people of different perspectives to learn about, debate, and celebrate the great vision of human freedom that unites us, the US Constitution. Okay, can you, there we go. And, and your, your homework is to have that memorized by, by next month. You are in for a treat. We have two of the leading and most thoughtful Supreme Court commentators in America here at a very uh, auspicious time. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts has just finished 10 years on the bench, and there's this wonderful new book out by Stephen Macy called American Justice 2015, the dramatic 10th term of the Roberts Court. Uh, Steve, who is the um, Supreme Court correspondent for The Economist, as well as being a professor of political science at Bard High School Early College in Manhattan, uh, completed this book uh, very quickly, as you can tell. Uh, it, about half of it apparently was written uh, before the end of the term and the, and the rest of it uh, in, in the month of July. So, and it's, um, you, 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 you must read it because it's uh, clear, vivid, has quite a, a stark and interesting and I think convincing thesis that I want to tell you about and just gives you a very nuanced sense about the cross-cutting divisions as well as the areas of, uh, of, of unanimity on the court. And joining him as his interlocutor is, I'm just gonna come out and say it, the most thoughtful Supreme Court uh, correspondent of our time. I'm gonna get into trouble with my great friends and colleagues in the Supreme Court press corps, but uh, there's Adam, Adam Liptak is unparalleled. He is the uh, Supreme Court correspondent of the Times. He has this incredible sidebar column where he both reads law review articles and scholarship and uh, helps people understand the cutting edge issues behind the court, but also goes out into the field, interviews litigants and reports on the stories behind the cases in ways that make his reporting unique. Uh, American Exception, which was his series on the way the US legal system differs from those of other developed nation, was a finalist for the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in explanatory reporting. He's also a lawyer and uh, was formerly a First Amendment uh, litigator. Uh, so let's uh, jump right in. And Stephen, um, well, first of all, what was it like to write a book this quickly? It was a, it was a lot of fun. You know, we're, we're used to writing uh, stories very quickly. We hear the oral argument, come downstairs, and have a couple of hours to put out 600 words. Uh, but part of what you long for is a chance to sit back and, and look at the case and think about its, its genesis and how it proceeds and how the oral argument fits into the written briefs and then look at the decision and to do that all in one short space. So I was able to um, reflect, even though I had very little time, I was able to look at the full scope of these 15 cases that I treat in, in this book and situate them in a context that uh, turns each one into kind of a story rather than just a report on a particular point along the way of each case. So I had a great time writing it and I uh, thank you for having me here today. This is a beautiful center and I want to thank my editor at, the, at Penn Press, Damon Linker, who's out here somewhere, uh, who uh, proposed this idea to me back in December. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to work on and I'm excited to be here today to talk about it. Wonderful. Uh, Two questions, and then I want to bring in Adam. You are a, a, a teacher and professor of political science, and you begin the book with a very stark statistic, uh, which is that two-thirds of Americans cannot name a single Supreme Court justice, and only 1% can name all nine. Uh, and that 1% is in this room right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they come to all of our town halls, and we love our phenomenal uh, audience. Uh, um, how, 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 do you, how, do, how do you intend to counterbalance that? Is this, is this an act of civic education? Are you trying to educate Americans about the court? You know, I didn't think about it in that way, but I tend, <clears throat> when I uh, 
when I sit down to, to write a piece, I'm always trying to appeal to the general reader who um, isn't attending oral arguments, isn't reading briefs, doesn't know what the questions of legal doctrine really are or, or why they matter. And so it's always a kind of translation of the esoteric and arcane into something that's not just di digestible, but that really shows what the import of the case is. And so I guess that's a civic education uh, process which goes on with, with, our, with our journalism. Uh, but when I was writing this book, I also wanted to situate the cases within um, sometimes a political theoretical context, uh, which is where I really com come from. My, uh, my training is in political theory. And what's most interesting to me about these cases is looking at the really fundamental questions. What is liberty? What is equality? How do we pursue them um, when there are conflicts between um, different principles? How are those resolved? And what's so fascinating about the Supreme Court is, um, as opposed to a political theory seminar room where you can talk about it forever, they have to make a decision. And it's, uh, it's been wonderful to be able to take part in looking at how that process un unfolds and then telling the story. I, I think, I, I love the way that you put it. The job of a journalist is to be a public educator and to translate these complicated uh, ideas for a general public, and you do that so well in this book. So let me begin with a claim that you make that would seem to some to be radical, uh, but you assert it confidently, which is you are not persuaded by cynics who say it's all politics. Instead, you say, you call yourself uh, someone who has a moderately optimistic perspective. You say the judges uh, are ruled by what John Rawls called public reason, and that unlike the other branches, they explain these public reasons and broadly, you think that each, in his or her own way, is attempting to interpret the Constitution and is guided by constitutional methodology rather than by political ideology. Tell us more about what persuaded you of that thesis. Sure. Well, uh, just a couple of words about this uh, view of public reason that John Rawls had. He was a 20th century liberal political theorist uh, who taught at Harvard for many decades, uh, died in, I think, 2003 or four. Uh, and he had this idea that the way that citizens in democracies should speak to, to each other in, in terms of trying to um, discuss political issues and persuade e each other of their positions is not by turning to their own personal metaphysical views, to their religious views, uh, to their narrow philosophical views, but to say, all right, we're in this together. We're in a democratic polity where people have wildly different views. So how do we present ourselves in such a way that we can uh, talk reasonably rationally? And Rawls points to the Supreme Court, and he uses the lowercase s and c, so not the US Supreme Court, but he was an American philosopher. He was thinking about it um, as the exemplar of what public reason is. That's because even if it's the case, and it's certainly the case that justices have political in influences, the Supreme Court is a political institution, still they, the process by which they make decisions is suffused with reason giving of a particular type throughout. Um, they are soliciting briefs from both parties, which they read carefully. They uh, have amicus briefs, that is fr fr friend of the court briefs, which come in uh, not parties to the case, but people who have an interest in the outcome, and they may not read all of those all the time or not spend as much time on them. But it's a whole written, very rigorously um, developed set of arguments which culminates in an oral argument, which I wish more Americans could see and not just read journalism about or hear, which they now can, um, where the justices really take their jobs very, very seriously. They come prepared. They ask um, very tough questions of both sides. And I outline in my, inter in, in my introduction several examples of unexpected questions you get from justices who seem to have a particular ide ideological take on a case, but end up asking questions that go against those particular beliefs. Uh, they, are, they don't always make the right decisions. They, certainly have their own 
um, views, and those views make their way into their opinions. But the process by which they go about coming to their conclusions is remarkable. And it, it's not always apparent if you just look at what the decisions are at the end of June when the most controversial decisions are made, and it looks like, well, you've got um, the right wing versus the left wing. It may boil down to that in some cases, but in most cases, they're very carefully um, reasoning through very difficult questions. And I think in most cases, they acquit themselves quite well. Thanks for that. Adam, what do you make of what Stephen calls his moderately upbeat perspective? Do you agree that the judges are guided by public reason and constitutional philosophy, or do you think that it's just all politics? Um, so I'm, I'm going to dissent a little bit, but first, thank you for having us. It's wonderful to be here. As Steve was walking in, he told me his mother-in-law was in the audience, and I said back to him, my mother-in-law is in the audience. <laughs> How do you like that? You must be um, really nervous, both of you. <laughs> So we're both on our best behavior. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to what Steve says, but it's not the whole story. In the most important decisions, the court routinely lines up five to four. That's not, not a bad thing by itself. These are very hard questions. They've divided the lower courts. Uh, they only get to the highest court if a lot of smart judges have already disagreed about them. And so it's not surprising. It doesn't bother me. It's, it's not a pet peeve of mine. Five, four is fine. But why is it always the same five and always the same four? Why is it always Justice Kennedy plus the liberals, Justice Kennedy plus the conservatives? I once asked a statistician at the end of a term to look at what the likelihood is of that array of justices uh, coming up in, in random. If you flip nine pennies in a row, how many times would you have that set of heads and that set of tails? It was in the quintillions. Um, now, that's not to say it's politics in the shorthand of partisan politics. I don't think the justices come on the court and say, let me look at the Republican Party platform, let me look at the Democratic Party platform and see what they want me to do. But I do think that, and you can talk, you, it's a slightly more abstract quality, it's ideological, it's, it's, it's a judicial philosophy, but as it happens, it tends to map on quite closely onto what partisan politicians might like the justices to do. In fact, when a president chooses a, a nominee, they care about how that justice is likely to vote. And that, that leads us to where we are now for the first time in American history. We have a closely divided court where every Republican appointee is to the right of every Democratic appointee. That may sound like it's the way things have always been or the way things are even supposed to work, but it's not. Never happened before. If you just think back on recent experience, we had justice on, on court, while well, I've covered it, which is only eight years. Justices Souter and Stevens, Republican appointees, voted left. Justice O'Connor, Republican appointee, moderate, trending left by the end of her time on the court. Chief Justice Warren, Justice Brennan, Justice Blackman, Republican appointees, voted left. Now, that does tell you a story that it seems to be all in one direction. Maybe Byron White is the only recent example going the other way. But it wasn't always the case that the appointing presidents party uh, predicted ideological voting on this court it does. Uh, Stephen, your response, you have a bunch of cases in the introduction where uh, Chief Justice Roberts, for example, broke with his conservative colleagues, including one involving anti-discrimination protections for pregnant women in the workplace, or a dispute about whether the First Amendment allows banning judicial candidates from soliciting campaign funds. What is your response to Adam's uh, slightly less uh, upbeat uh, perspective about uh, the dissonance between politics and the justices? Well, um, Adam is, is right about the trends in terms of uh, Supreme Court justices mapping on to the politics of the, of the nominating presidents. That's not deniable. But when you look at the cases as they come down, there are really only a few each year that are five to four decisions that line up in this very traditional way. Um, so maybe the one in a quintillion happens five times in the term, which is suspect, but it doesn't happen 66 times. Um, the court is nine to zero about half the time. Um, it's five to four about a quarter of the time. It was last year, I think, 20, 26 percent. Uh, but the five and the four do change, do change around. Um, Chief Justice Roberts did uh, defect from, if you want to call it, the right wing of the court in, in several notable cases. 
um, voting to save the Affordable Care Act for the second time in, in three years, uh, which, is no, which is no small thing. He earned a lot of um, consternation from the right um, after that. Ted Cruz, who was his great supporter when he was nominated back in 2005, uh, said, you know, he's now a judicial tyrant. Uh, Mike Huckabee said he put on an Obama jersey when he ruled in, in that case. So I think the fact that, and there, there are other cases and there are other justices who move seemingly from right to left. We didn't see a lot of the left to right movement in the previous term and maybe in the past couple terms. The, the, the liberal block of Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan um, have been voting rather reliably together. It's the conservative bloc that seems maybe a little more reasonable in the, in the sense that they, uh, they look at the issues case by case and aren't necessarily uh, tied in to the right wing position. Um, so uh, there are other cases we could talk about. Well, let's, we, we will talk about uh, the specific cases, bless you, because we run through them so well in the book. But Adam, uh, we just had a good uh, podcast discussion about Chief Justice Roberts at 10. What determines the cases when he breaks ranks with the conservatives and those that he does not? I, you know, I think he takes them case by case as a general matter. I think he's broken, let, let's put it this way. There are two instances in recorded history where John Roberts has joined the liberals in a five to four decision. One of them was the first, first Affordable Care Act. The other was a uh, case about campaign finance and judges in this last term. So it's not something you see every day. Uh, Steve picked out 15 important cases. I, I compared them to a chart. We had, we had by coincidence also 15 cases in a chart that I picked the 15 most important cases. And we agreed on 13 of them. So between the two of us, we have 17 big cases. Only two of them were unanimous. So on the big, big cases, that's not what you're seeing. It's true, the court is unanimous a lot of the time, 40% the last term, 60% the term before, mostly in minor statutory cases. But on the big, big cases, uh, they divide, and they divide predictably. Of the 17 cases I counted up between the two of us, uh, eight of them were 5-4. Six of those eight were 5-4 along the classical lines, Kennedy plus liberal, Kennedy plus conservative. So you see 75% of the time, you're, you're seeing the phenomenon I, I was describing. Well, let's, uh, one more beat on this, uh, Steve. I asked uh, Chief uh, Justice Breyer in a public interview a few years ago, you know, what determines whether or not the cases are five to four. And he said, often in statutory cases that are more technical, you may not know what you think in advance. You don't have strong prior commitments, and therefore you're more likely to listen to the other side. Whereas on the big constitutional cases, abortion, affirmative action, people know what they think and are not mm -hmm. going to change their minds. Is, 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 might, might that explain some of it? It may, but there may be something else to it. The fact that the, the constitutional cases are more difficult may also owe something to the fact that the Constitution is more difficult to interpret than most statutes. I was looking through the, the cases that I, that, I, that I cover in this book and noticed that um, not all of them are hard cases, truly hard cases. Um, four or five of them I would classify as pretty easy cases. And all of those that I would classify as easy cases are statutory ones. They're ones that involve um, laws passed by Congress or laws passed by the 50 states, which are, in most cases, easier to interpret. And uh, there aren't as many open questions. There aren't the deep philosophical questions that underlie them, um, such as you know, what is cruel or unusual punishment, what is equality, what is, what is liberty, those sorts of really deep, very difficult questions are not usually implicated when it's just a statute that the justices have to, have to look at. Um, so, and it's, uh, we're in the National Constitution Center, not the National Statutory Center. <laughs> but I think it is worth noting that... That we could change our motto, actually. We'd, be, we'd get even more uh, of an audience. <laughs> but I think it is worth noting that when it comes to a statute, especially with the cases that I cover in Chapter 1, um, there are two different religious liberty cases that um, are much easier to resolve based on the language that Congress has provided 
in a law written in 2000 and a law from, from 1964 than the few words of the, of the first, first Amendment, which have uh, multiple and very distinct views from, from different justices, that they're likely to continue to expound as, the case, as, as new cases come. Well, why don't you talk about those uh, two cases uh, which involved religious accommodations for Muslims? Right, so there were two Muslims who both won their cases um, at the Supreme Court in, in the previous year. Uh, one was a 9-0 decision, another was 8-1. to one. Um, And one of the defendants, uh, one of the plaintiffs was much more sympathetic than, than the other. Um, a 17-year-old woman named Samantha Elof uh, applied for a job at a local Abercrombie and Fitch store. And the interview went great. Her, uh, her marks were high, her marks were high enough to get the job. Um, but when the interviewer spoke to a manager and noted that she had worn a hijab, a Muslim headscarf, to the interview, the manager said, uh-oh, um, we're going to have to decrease her appearance score. And that caused her to um, be denied that, that job. Um, the Abercrombie uh, stores have a look policy, which has since changed, but uh, it says, A, no caps, and B, no black. And she was wearing a black headscarf. So it, it wasn't that it was a headscarf that was the problem. It was the problem that she was wearing something on her head, and it wasn't colorful. So she was denied the job, and she sued. And in Justice Scalia's decision in that case, um, he's, he he opened when he read his when he read his ruling from from the bench by saying this is a really easy case. Title seven of the nineteen sixty four Civil Rights Act says you can't deny someone a job, or or hire someone because of their particular religious faith. Um, there was a concurrence from Justice Alito that I thought was persuasive, and there was one dissenting vote from uh, Justice Thomas, uh, but. This was a pretty easy case, and it was because the statute's clear. It says you can't fail to hire someone because they have a particular religious belief. Um, the other case involved a law with a funny acronym, our, our LUPA, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, in which um, a Muslim inmate in Arkansas wanted to grow a beard, but there was a strict no beards policy um, at his prison and uh, the prison officials wouldn't budge. Uh, the beard wasn't just for uh, personal uh, reasons. It was because he thought it was his, uh, his duty as, as a Muslim to have a beard. Uh, the, the prison said, I'm sorry, we can't allow beards um, on our prisoners because there's a risk that they could hide contraband in them, um, SIM cards, razor blades. Um, it was a pretty laughable oral argument uh, because, as Justice Alito uh, made, made a mockery of the uh, lawyer from, from Arkansas's case, it's, you know, it's very difficult to really hide a whole lot of weaponry in a half-inch beard. And so that was a 9-0 decision. Um, all, the, all the correspondents walked out of the, uh, of the oral argument saying, well, he clearly won. Are there any votes uh, to support the, the prison in this case? And we found out a few months later the answer was, was no. Adam, um, in, as uh, Stephen notes, in the whole uh, case involving beards, where Justice Alito did have that great line, he said, couldn't you just give the officials a comb to make sure that there were no uh, weapons being hidden in the beard? Uh, Justice Ginsburg has a very interesting concurrence distinguishing this case from the Hobby Lobby case. And she says, unlike the exemption this court approved in Hobby Lobby, accommodating petitioners' religious beliefs in this case would not detrimentally affect others who do not share petitioners' belief. The question of what sort of exemptions religious individuals and corporations should have from anti-discrimination and other neutral laws is one of the hottest ones before the court. It may arise in a case the court could take this year called Little Sisters of the Poor. Tell us about some of these cases involving religious exemptions mm -hmm. that are on the horizon. So one way to think about why the Hobbes case might have been unanimous is it's an easy case, what's it doing in the court? It may be that the court wants to establish some principles it can use in other settings. So the court is very good on free speech issues involving really distasteful speech. And that, that may be partly because the court also wants to use the First Amendment in, say, a campaign finance setting. 
and it likes to be consistent and it likes to establish principles that will cut across many kinds of cases. And that's precisely Justice Ginsburg's fear in Hobbes that this religion protective uh, decision will then be used as the court has already indicated it might in cases involving uh, the contraception mandate. The contraception mandate is a regulation under the Affordable Care Act that requires employers to provide free contraception coverage, insurance coverage to their female workers. Uh, the court has already said that uh, for a for-profit corporation, uh, you, you can't do that, or at least one that's closely held by a religious family. The follow-on case moves from the corporate setting to the religiously affiliated setting of, say, a church school or a church hospital that employs you know, women of all faiths, and they too don't want to provide contraception coverage for at least abortifacients, which they consider to be sinful. And the Obama administration has offered them a compromise. They say, okay, we're not gonna force you to do it. You don't have to pay for it. You just sign a form and we'll take care of it. They come back and say, we don't want to sign your form because even that makes us complicit in sin. So that's the next level of case that's going to get to the court. And, uh, you know, Congress has, under the statute that Steve mentioned and a sister statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, <coughs> required courts to use a very searching standard of scrutiny to decide whether burdens on religion uh, are acceptable or not. And I think, Jeff, you're right, they're likely to take the case. And I think, you know, there are four and maybe five votes to, to say even this accommodation I described is not acceptable. But in, in Hobby Lobby, Justice Alito did mention that um, there are other ways that um, the contraceptive could, could get to the workers. And the accommodation that he gives an example of is exactly the one that the administration gave to the religious nonprofits. Not it's, a, it's a curious thing. He said, he did he said a that's bit. a less restrictive alternative. I'm not saying it's an acceptable alternative, but it's less restrictive. Right, right. It's hard to imagine what other more narrowly tailored way of providing contraceptives is, is thinkable other than the one that's already been offered to these groups. Well, no, there are, there are less restrictive. The government could simply pay for it from the get-go could not require any kind of intercession, or the government could figure out who your insurance company is and go directly to the insurance company. So there are ways to take the institution out of the link, but maybe we don't want to descend too much further into the weeds of this particular okay. case. Except to ask Justice Ginsburg, and Hobby Lobby had a parade of horribles where religiously objecting doctors could refuse to give medical care and so forth. Do you think that there are five votes on the court for exemptions that broad? Um, I've, uh, I wouldn't uh, try to predict who would vote uh, in, in which way on, on, on a case like that, since we don't quite have one yet. Um, but, a, but a perfectly conceivable follow-on case is the case of someone not wanting to provide a service to a, to a gay couple, say, uh, on religious grounds. And that sets up the same kind of conflict. And in Hobby Lobby, in the Alito majority, he said, well, if it was race discrimination, uh, we don't think that would fly. But he was conspicuously silent on other forms of discrimination. Well, we will have a series of great debates on that question. Let's turn to freedom of speech. You talk about three cases. Steve, one was seven to two, and that involved brutal threats on Facebook. The other two were five to four. One involved Confederate license plates, and the other is that judicial campaigning case we mentioned, without really getting into the facts of all three of them. Right. How would you characterize the court on free speech, um, we do uh, have a series of nearly eight to one decisions where liberal and conservative justices protect very offensive speech like funeral protests or horrific animal torture videos with only Justice Alito in dissent, but then you have the divisions you've described here. Is, does, does the free speech case cases support your idea that it's not just politics but it's more uh, constitutional philosophy? I, th I think so, yeah. There, there's one case, this term, that came up as a as a First Amendment case, and Chief Justice Roberts was able to kind of spin it a bit and avoid saying anything about what the First Amendment says about this particular person's speech. And this is the, uh, it was known as the Facebook threats case, Alonis v. U.S. And Mr. Alonis was um, getting a divorce from his wife and was not happy about it and turned to Facebook 
of all places, as the place where he could vent. And uh, he, he developed his own um, rap name and started writing rap lyrics, which he said were in the style of Eminem. Um, one of them, one of the lyrics was the following, there's one way to love ya, but a thousand ways to kill ya, and I'm not going to rest until your body is a mess. Soaked in blood and dying. Can we have from this a little more rapid? <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just had the great pleasure of seeing Hamilton, so you're gonna have to do better than that. <laughs> All right, can someone give me a beat? But I'm right. bum bum. Got the threats, and you know I'm, you can do it. Hurry up and die, bitch. No, I, I think I won't do. Uh... Hey, this is the National Constitution, sir. Right. <laughs> so that's the kind of uh, sorted lyrics that Alonis was um, spreading on his Facebook timeline or wall or, or whatever it's called now. Um, and I think that this was a case too far for Chief Justice Roberts, or at least he was able to find a way to reverse Alonis' con conviction, which, was, uh, which he had been sentenced to 44 months in, in prison, without saying, what I just read you has the exalted status of First Amendment um, speech, which is, which is protected by the, for, by the First Amendment. He was able to just look at the federal criminal statute on threats and say, the jury didn't apply the correct uh, standard here. They shouldn't have asked whether a reasonable person would view it as a threat. Instead, they should ask, and he wasn't specific about what they should ask, but he said, that's not enough. You have to show that Alonis um, and anyone in a similar situation had some consciousness of what he was doing in issuing a, a threat. The level of consciousness that he left up, up in the air and Justice Alito took him to task for that in a partial dissent. Um, some people count this case as seven to two. I counted it as eight to one because Alito also decided he wanted to reverse that um, sentence for Alonis. So I think um, there, the court is willing to uphold First Amendment claims even for very nasty speech that has very little value in order to protect the principle more generally for all of us who want to sit and talk in a nice, reasonable way in a beautiful hall. Um, but where he can avoid uh, providing the First Amendment stamp of approval on, on something like what I just read, he'll, he'll do that. And he, he was able to do that in this case. There may be cases down the road in which he'll have a hard time avoiding whether the First Amendment protects that kind of violent speech. Adam, a broad question, but how would you distinguish the cases where the court, eight to one or seven to two, uh, unites around this principle that the speech we hate has to be protected, and those cases where it divides five to four, like Citizens United and the Confederate license plate case? I think almost everyone on the court agrees that uh, unpopular views by dissenting minority groups, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church, which wants to spew hateful speech, or the guy who claims to have won a medal he didn't win, Th those are sort of easy cases for much of the court. Um, I, I would say that I think your choice of cases I indicated is very good, but it did, if I were your editor, I would have urged you to add one First Amendment case called Reed Against Town of Gilbert, which did seem to me to revolutionize First Amendment law. Written by Justice Thomas, it, the case involves church signs, but it really doesn't matter what it involves. It said that all content-based restrictions which are just about any law involving speech. Securities regulation is a content-based restriction. Laws regulating uh, fraudulent advertising content-based restriction is subject to the most searching kind of judicial scrutiny, strict scrutiny. That, that's a huge move for the court, and that indicates that the conservative project of using the First Amendment as a way to deregulate vast areas of uh, commercial and political speech continues to be on the march. Uh, Stephen, first of all, D Damon, why didn't you make Stephen mention uh, that, that uh, important case? And what do you make of it? Because the, this trend Adam talks about, where lots of regulation is now being challenged as a violation of the First Amendment, uh, in including Google's claim that everything that it does in, uh, in, the in the arrangement of its algorithm is protected speech and therefore can't be regulated, is, is a bold claim and does create a strong uh, ideological divide. What do you make of it? Hmm. Um, well, yeah, that, that was one case that I maybe should have added. Uh, it was already a, I wanted to keep each issue to one chapter, and there were already three in that one, so. I know I you started it. out with a list of 10, so it was already growing. <laughs> it did grow. 
And you only had right. a, a month, so it's, it's, it's completely understandable. Right, right. Um, I think, you know, Adam's, Adam's claim that, or Adam's view that the court is in, and will likely to con continue to be very protective of all forms of, of speech, including commercial speech, uh, is, is true. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see. There's a, there's a case uh, that hasn't reached the Supreme Court, but uh, Google recently um, won, won a suit um, in which, well, th this was really a, a copyright case, not a, not a First Amendment. One, um, but just to, to note it briefly, uh, there are a number of authors who uh, who sued Google because their books were being put up on, on the internet and made searchable through Google Books, uh, which now has over 20 million titles. Uh, and th there's been a number of years of litigation on this, and uh, the circuit court just ruled that um, in, in, in favor of Google that it can maintain its Google Books website as long as it gives an out to those authors who don't want their books. Um, uh, well, they, they are searchable, but uh, not to provide snippets of them to those who, who, are, who are searching. Uh, so those, those of you at home who are, um, who are using Google Books can, can be safe in, in the thought that you'll still have access to that moving forward. Uh, lots of cases here, but we need to talk about uh, the Obamacare case, King and Burwell and Obergefell, the marriage equality case. Uh, Adam, uh, Steve asked the questions. We don't know which justices voted to hear King v. Burwell. We just know that four of them did so. Given the fact that the court ended up deciding uh, six to three with Justices Roberts and Kennedy joining the liberals, that the Affordable Care Act's tax exemption extended to federally created exchanges, why did the court agree to hear King v. Burrell? Uh, it only takes four votes of the nine to put a case on the docket. There were four dissenters who were very, very angry in the first Affordable Care Act case, and they thought maybe they had a chance to get the chief. In the second Affordable Care Act case, they turned out to be wrong, but if you had to guess who put it on the agenda, it was probably uh, the folks who lost the first time. At the same time, there are issues that are important enough and that have divided the lower courts enough that all of the justices agree that it has to be settled in the end by the Supreme Court. So there's not always strategic or ideological voting about what cases to put on the docket. Here, whether the lower courts were authentically divided is a little hard to say because on the one hand, on the same day, two federal appeals courts did come to different conclusions. But before the Supreme Court acted, one of them, the District of Columbia Circuit, uh, vacated and agreed to hear the case again uh, as a full court on banc, as lawyers would say. So the ordinary practice might have been to wait for the D.C. Circuit, and that, that seemed to indicate that somebody was in a rush to hear the case. On the other hand, <coughs> the claim was, uh, rejected as it turned out, but the claim was that the Obama administration was spending billions and billions of dollars unlawfully on these uh, subsidies. So that's maybe something the Supreme Court should address sooner rather than later. Just so I understand, I know it's inside baseball, but you're saying that Justice Kennedy, one of the original dissenters in the first healthcare case, voted to hear the second one and then changed his mind and decided it was okay? All speculation, don't know, but yes, that's what I think. And I also think this was the rare case where a lot of people involved in the court's work thought the claim in King v. Burwell was legally more plausible when the briefing began than when the briefing concluded and the Solicitor General in particular put together a very persuasive brief to the minds of many. Uh, Steve, you uh, praise Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in King v. Burwell. You say the most remarkable aspect of his opinion is a few pages in which he presents a cheerfully lucid account of the crisis in the American healthcare system. The summary is pithier and clearer than anything the Obama administration ever put out and almost has the ring of a brochure for Obamacare. <laughs> Tell us more about that. Well, that, you know, it sounds like I'm Mike Huckabee in that, <laughs> in that passage. But he does, he's, he's an excellent writer. His opinions are crisp and uh, very well argued. He doesn't leave a lot of holes for people to, to, poke, to, poke, to poke holes in. Um, and that opinion, you know, if the dissenters are complaining that Chief Justice Roberts was 
kind of a cheerleader for the, uh, for the Affordable Care Act, I can see why they might think that. Because he really did say, okay, there's a crisis in American health care. Congress decided to do something about that crisis. Here's how they did it. And he lays out very lucidly, very clearly, and yes, I think cheerfully, you know, um, it, we, we need to protect people who have, who have pre-existing pre conditions. So health insurance companies have to take all comers and not increase their rates if they happen to have a disease. Second, um, we have to mandate that everybody is going to have a health insurance policy if we're going to expect the, the, the insurers to spend all the money that they would, they would, or they would otherwise um, use to jack up rates. So there's an individual mandate on people to buy policies. And third, which is the issue in King, uh, we need to provide, we need to make it easier for lower income Americans to buy health insurance policies if we're going to tell them that they have to buy them. So he had a very straightforward view that, you know, these three parts of the, these three legs of the, of the health care law all work together. If you take one out, the whole thing falls, falls over. And to say that individuals who buy health, health insurance policies on, federal, on federally run exchanges, that is in 34 states, if you're going to say they don't get subsidies, well, a lot of them are not going to be able to afford the, the policies. And the whole thing is going to spiral out of control. And um, everyone's, uh, the law is not going to be effective. It's not going to provide affordable health care. And so he provided a very charitable reading of what Congress was trying to do with this law. And, uh, you know, in, in line with what I read in the New York Times last summer from Jeffrey Rosen, um, this was a case in which I think the Chief Justice was uh, true to his word that he's an umpire, he's calling balls and strikes as he sees them. And what he sees here is a statute that Congress uh, passed with certain purposes, and it would be not only uncharitable, but it would uh, deprive eight million people of their health insurance and wreck a whole law to read four words out of context and to read them in such a way that the law dissolves. So yes, I'm a fan of that opinion, um, and I think Chief Justice Roberts uh, was, knew he was going to take it on the chin for a second time from the right wing and did it anyway because he thought that's the way the case should have come out. Adam, you wrote more extensively and insightfully in the New York Times about how Roberts' opinions in the health care case and the marriage equality cases were of a piece. Tell us about your views on that. There's, a, there's this phrase people use, judicial activism. And usually it just means a decision I disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it does have a more particular meaning. It, uh, you know, political scientists and others would say, it means striking down an action by another branch, uh, striking down a, a law. And in, in, in the two cases Jeff mentioned, the Affordable Care Act case and, uh, and the same-sex marriage case, the Chief Justice took the consistent idea that it's up to other people to decide, that Congress passed the Affordable Care Act, he was going to let it stand, that voters in uh, four states decided they didn't want to let same-sex couples marry, he was going to let it stand. And if that's your definition of judicial activist, neither, neither position taken by the Chief Justice was activist. It was deferential. Um, I don't know that this is something that we see in all of Roberts' opinions. When you think of Citizens United, or the Second Amendment case Heller, or the, the uh, voting rights County. case Shelby County, but in those two cases at least, it's not hard to reconcile his judicial uh, philosophy. What? Even though one result conservative, one result uh, liberal. An important question then, uh, Stephen, what determines when Roberts is inclined to defer and when he's not? Well, that's a very difficult question. That's getting inside, uh, trying to get inside his head. Um, I mean, it's possible that he has certain views that are so deeply rooted in his consciousness, in his soul, that he finds it difficult to rule otherwise. You know, if he... Um, if he, in the Shelby County case from 2013, in which uh, a main part of the Voting Rights Act uh, was, was gutted, and uh, it was, this was an act of overturning a 
an, an act of Congress which had been reaffirmed by strong majorities in Congress in, in, in 2006, this is a case in which he said, all right, my judgment trumps those of Congress. Um, it, it feels very strong about something. If he really thinks that there is, um, if there's a constitutional problem with the law, he'll still, he's still willing to strike it down, as any Supreme Court justice must. Uh, it's, it's hard to say exactly why it is certain cases are in that category for him and others are ones in which he's happy to defer to what the political branches, as they're called, um, do. Adam, what's your answer to the question? When does he defer and when does he not? What's his constitutional philosophy that leads to deference in the health care and marriage equality cases and lack of deference in the Shelby County and Citizens United cases? Here's, here's all I know. There are two examples of uh, Chief Justice Roberts in, in major decisions uh, reaching uh, in closely divided major decisions reaching liberal outcomes. They both involve the Affordable Care Act. In every other major decision, he goes the other way. Sometimes it's activist, sometimes it's deferential, but the outcome is a conservative one. And what do you make of that? I make of it that it would be hard thus to ascribe a detailed constitutional philosophy that would happen to result in those outcomes. <laughs> If, if you were to describe his constitutional philosophy, how would you describe it? <laughs> I, I think that there are justices on the court, and in, you know, on the right side of the court in particular, who are uh, committed to a constitutional vision of originalism, which sometimes, not often, but sometimes leads them to a liberal result, as in cases involving sentencing or flag burning or the confrontation of witnesses. I'm talking about Justices Scalia and Thomas. When you look at the other conservatives on the court, it's much, much harder to weave together uh, a, a constitutional philosophy. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll continue to duck your question in extended ways. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Stephen, you said that it's all about constitutional <coughs> philosophy and not about politics. So how would you describe Chief Justice Roberts' constitutional oh, philosophy? Oh, boy. Um, I don't know if I have a better answer than the one I just gave. Uh, I mean, what Adam seemed to be politely not saying <laughs> is that there seems to be some inconsistency in the way that Chief Justice Roberts rules. Um, but you could say the same for any of the justices, I think, um, if you look at any number of cases in which they are, appear activist in, in one sense, and uh, if you look at a different issue, they want to defer to the political branches. It is, I mean, it, there is something, there is some truth to what you said, that an activist ruling is one that you don't think went the right way. Um, it's there, these are difficult questions, especially the constitutional ones, and there are always questions on, on, on the margin, and some will come down on some side, on, on one side, and some will come down on the other. Jeff, you're a great student of the court. What's the answer to your question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turning the tables. Well, I, I did venture a, an answer in that, in that Time's Up ed that uh, Stephen mentioned, and I said, Maybe this was a little overconfident. Chief Justice Roberts has an entirely consistent uh, constitutional philosophy. He's generally inclined to defer to Congress and the states, except when he feels that an explicit constitutional prohibition requires him to go otherwise. So, in, uh, What's the explicit constitutional prohibition in Shelby County? The 14th Amendment's uh, colorblind provision, which he reads into the Equal Protection Clause. I'm not saying that I agree with it, but the text it, it, is the Equal Protection Clause, and he believes that the text clearly requires colorblindness. Is, I, for, for the I'll, record, I'll leave you alone in just a second, but what I recall from Shelby County is he said the constitutional provision uh, that calls for the equal dignity of the states uh, is what compelled the result. And I've uh, spent some time searching the Constitution for that phrase or that idea, and I couldn't find it. Well, it's the Tenth Amendment he's referring to. Okay, anyway. Right. Tenth Amendment, equal dignity, you know, it's just all... <laughs> I, this is worth uh, pressing on. You know, as, as it happens, uh, I was... So I've just finished this book on uh, Justice Brandeis, which is coming out in June, and also wrote it really fast in the end. And there's something very bracing about a deadline. Yeah. But I also was struggling to come up with, it was the same thing with him, because he was generally very keen on deference to the states as laboratories of democracy, but at the same time wrote the greatest free speech and privacy opinions of the 20th century, striking down state laws. And there, too, I said, 
when there was an explicit prohibition, the Fourth Amendment or the First Amendment, he wasn't deferential, but otherwise he was. But the counter is his judicial philosophy, like Chief Justice Roberts, seems to coincide very precisely with his strongly held views on political economy. And he opposes the curse of bigness in business and government and votes to strike down the part of the New Deal that uh, opposes it and so forth. So it might be fair, and I'm now just thinking aloud here, that uh, it's uh, both Roberts and Brandeis broadly embrace judicial deference, but because their results coincide so closely with their politics, maybe they don't get to be called deference people. I'm still I'm tinkering with the introduction, and I'll stay tuned. We'll, we'll see where I come down on those questions. All right, some questions from our wonderful audience. We begin with a wonderful FYI. Uh, today's New York Times crossword. She was replaced by Alito. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. I know our panelists know it. The answer is O'Connor. Excellent. This is a highly informed audience. Uh, next question, uh, uh, Stephen, how can Congress over undo the Citizen United decision? <laughs> oh. <laughs> They're like, okay, let's get to the point. Good. How can Congress undo the Citizens United decision? Well, as a matter of constitutional principle, they can't. That's my answer. I mean, they can, they can, um, they can work on other campaign finance regulations which may pass constitutional muster, and they can um, be careful when interviewing the next uh, nominee to the Supreme Court to see what they say about Citizens United. Uh, in, in just a couple weeks ago, Hillary Clinton said that one of her number one, or her number one um, question for any Supreme Court justice that she would consider nominating would be, what do you think about Citizens United? So it, it takes one more vote. That might be the best Congress can do, uh, the Senate can do in uh, determining what happens with the legacy of that case. Any other options, Adam? Congress, of course, can propose a constitutional amendment, but is that... Short of a like? constitutional amendment or a change in personnel on the court, the, the core broad ruling of Citizens United will stand. There are things Citizens United uh, endorsed. The, the eight justices said they were in favor of disclosure requirements. Congress could certainly have much more rigorous disclosure requirements and drive out dark money from the political system. Congress could also easily pass laws more effectively policing the coordination gap that's supposed to exist between independent expenditure groups and candidates themselves. So there are ways to address some of what some people think are the pernicious consequences of Citizens United. A perennial question, and our smart audience wants to know, Steve, Adam, do you believe the Supreme Court should televise arguments? And what's the latest action there as well? I don't think there's been any action, and all of the justices say, sorry, we don't want to do that. Even those who were open to the idea before they, they got to the bench, once, they're, once they got to the bench, say, you know what, actually, now that I'm here, I kind of like having the privacy. And the arguments they give uh, are, well, the average American viewer is not going to really understand what we do, and our words are going to be taken out of context. You know, you'll have snippets on the nightly news, but you won't really, the, the viewer won't really get a sense of um, what the whole argument is or what the arcane legal principles be behind the arguments are. But I don't know. I mean, they, they release the, the audio. They give you the transcript. So anybody who wants to can go and listen or, or read. Why not also allow the American people to see what goes on there. This is a remarkable institution. Um, being able to be in the press gallery for the past couple of years with people as smart as Adam and, and watch um, as they undertake this uh, very you know, fascinating procedure of um, grilling the best prepared lawyers in the country who have been doing moot courts for the past several months on, on these issues and giving the very best arguments, usually, that can be given for, for their sides. This, is, uh, this would be the best civic education in how the judiciary works, or at least how the highest court works, that, that we could provide. So I say, let's do it. But I don't think anyone that's uh, on the court has my view. Adam, you get this question all the time. Should we have cameras? And also, how would it change your job? I, this is an argument against self-interest. I'm better off, I think, without the cameras, so people have to rely on me. And the, <laughs> and the, and the snippets I choose to use, which we call quotations, uh, 
Uh, I think there's no principled argument against allowing citizens in a democracy to see their government at work in a public setting. I don't get it at all. I don't think the arguments you hear, and Steve listed a couple of them, bear any weight. The notion that people aren't smart enough to see what the court is doing is deeply paternalistic and ugly. Um, I think their real concerns are they don't want to be mocked on late night television. That's, that's an authentic concern. They do say goofy things, but it's not a principled concern. Uh, I think they want to re keep their privacy. They want to go shopping in Whole Foods without being bothered. That's an authentic concern. It's not a principled Justice concern. Justice Scalia doesn't shop at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> or where, where does he shop? Um, and, I, and the clause was set back this last term where we had three different protests in the courtroom, two of them about Citizens United, one of them about same-sex marriage. And I think I can't but say that you know, if, if people knew they were going to be on television, you might get more of that. But again, the answer to that is better security. It's not to shut people out from uh, seeing their government at work. Um, like the Supreme Court, National Constitution Center panels must end precisely on time when the red light goes off at the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Stephen and Adam. Go buy this wonderful book, and Adam will uh, sign it and talk to you. Uh, or, or Steve, even. No, exactly. 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 Yeah.